Hey everyone, I'm Carolyn Cooper with CFIN, and today I'm talking with Alan Hills, who is a senior hiring consultant with CPG Executive Search, specialists in hiring for the food and beverage manufacturing industry. Hi, Alan. Hi, Carolyn. How are you? Good. How are you? Good. Nice to chat again. Today we're talking about hiring in the food and beverage industry. So, Alan, what can you tell us about uh, what are some of the most in-demand skills and jobs uh, in the food industry today, and, and what emerging jobs are you seeing? I'm seeing right now we have a pretty big aging population in regards to the food and beverage industry with maintenance, sanitation, and some of the, the technical roles out on the floor, including also some of the engineering roles. Um, I found that we had a little bit of an exodus at one time going into other industries, including the cannabis industry for a while, but we also have situations now where we have a lot of people that are running facilities that are probably five years from retirement and we need more contingency plans on who's going to slot into these roles going forward uh, with these food and beverage companies. Uh, here in Ontario, we probably have a little bit more access to more people and more talent pool, but across Canada, it starts slimming out a bit. So also relocation is going to be a factor for some of these people too. If we want technical and skilled people to go in these roles and stay in the food, be food and beverage industry or come into the food and beverage industry. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, and are there different sectors of the industry that are facing higher labor shortages? I would say, well, for me, I do a lot of work in the meat industry. That's a big struggle, always will be a big struggle, especially with some of my companies that might be working in slaughter, which is not exactly a nice term and it's not enticing to most people. So companies like IE, like Conestoga Meat Packers or a Maple Lodge Farms or Cargill, they're always going to be looking for people uh, because it's hard to get people to work in those cold environments. And the other thing with that, too, is a lot of these companies are running multiple shifts, too. So you could be working midnights or afternoons. So that creates challenges. But all of those companies are constantly looking for people to handle any maintenance department type stuff. And staffing out sanitation would be the toughest one. In fact, most companies just outsource that to another company rather than take it on themselves. Okay. Definitely the toughest roles for us to fill as recruiters are those areas. Right. And, and has that changed a lot in the past decade? It has because we like at one time, you know, like myself, <laughs> I was a lot younger at this 10 years ago. So we've had a lot of people retire in the last few years. Uh, mm. We've lost people to other sectors that are a little more enticing money wise and maybe even more ambiance of the shop floor, i.e. pharmaceutical and automotive. Um, so that's where, yeah. That's getting even worse as we go along. Um, I've struggled on maintenance manager roles the last while, just mm -hmm. getting four or five people for the client that are actually very interested. Okay. And that, that would be a big problem right now in the food industry. Right. So the other thing we talk a lot about is new technology, new food technology and automation uh, coming to a lot of manufacturing plants. Do you find that companies are looking to retrain their employees or are they looking for non-food professionals from other industries, say uh, control specialists or engineers? Yeah, I think what companies are starting to do and some of my clients are starting to embrace that specifically, say we were looking at uh, process improvements or CI out on the floor that we start bringing in engineers that have come out of other industries that are familiar with more automation. Um, overall, I would say the food and beverage industry is a little behind some other industries in regards to automation, but that's changing because, you know, from a food safety standpoint, the less human touch is probably the better on a production floor. So, yeah, I'm finding now that they're starting to embrace more, bringing some people in from other industries in that area. Uh, the retraining component, Carolyn, is important because, you know, to bring them in, there's a little, there's differences on the floor, perishability, first in, first out, the stuff that you want to do to get people moving in. And then there's my dog barking, so we might want to. <laughs> <laughs> Who I was, to was told was under control, but she never is. Anyway, um, yeah, that uh, that would be something that companies are going to have to consider a lot more because we do have a lot of talented people here in other industries that we could slot into these roles. And a lot of them with engineering degrees from either here or back home too as well. 
Okay. And uh, what do these non-food professionals need to know about working in the food industry and, and what's different than other industries? Time. Time factors. Uh, a lot of big difference a lot of times, like with coming in and realizing that you're working a lot more in real time. Like I said, you, a lot of times in specifically meat, for example, where you're trying to bring the product in and get it out the door, you know, in regards to, you know, perishability. So that area. And the other thing, too, in working in these environments is understanding of, like, food safety. Like, a lot of people have come into situations where they worry more about health and safety on the floor or EHS, but they're not as worried. They've never been involved with food safety. And that's a big thing with people transitioning over specifically in quality, but we don't tend to go outside of the food industry to bring anyone into quality. That's one area I still stick with in the industry. Mm -hmm. So that's how I look at that area. Okay. And you also mentioned earlier that the environment is different than other industries. I mean, there's cold environments, hot environments. It's, it's different in that way as well. Yeah, it's very different. And then like, I, I found that where we haven't had an issue with transition is with some of the beverage companies. It's a lot easier because there's a lot more automation, i.e. like a Molson or an InBev. But with some of the, the companies we work with, also some of the companies I work with, some of the small to medium businesses, they're still pretty manual. And mm -hmm. um, this is things that are going to need to change going forward too, because we still have companies out there that uh, run HACCP in their QA programs with like handbooks and booklets in their offices and they don't, digitize enough right and um that's something we'll see we'll be embracing more like they do in europe in the future too right okay so is it difficult to compete for these sort of professionals from other industries is the food industry behind in that in that ter uh, way in terms of co competition i would say that's regional in some ways uh like windsor for example we've done some roles out there it's very hard to compete with the large automotive companies um, here in around Southern Ontario, you can compete with them, but you got Magnum, some of these other big companies and they tend to pay really well. And they do a lot of times they'll do like a signing bonus and, uh, they'll mm -hmm. aggressively go and find people. And then plus they'll also go and recruit outside of the country and have people working to bring people in. We're doing more of that now. Um, Conestoga meat packers in Kitchener is a great job. They went on like over to China and Ukraine and the Philippines trying to find skilled help. What we want to do is not have to have people go over to other countries to find help. We'd like to find them internally. Um, but again, that's a struggle because I find a lot of people when they come here, they're more inclined to jump into something like pharmaceutical or automotive because they pay up front more than overall than any food companies do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So in terms of continuing continuing education or reskilling, what are you suggesting uh, companies do with current employees? Well, as you know, we have a lot of programs. There's a lot in the Guelph area. Um, I know there's the one at Conestoga College is doing a lot of really good stuff with that. Niagara College is doing a lot of stuff as well, too. Some of these things can be done online. Uh, some can be done on weekends. Uh, in regards to further training, I don't really think it matters where you're at in your career. Anyone could use further training. Anything that's just keeping you educated on new trends and moving you forward is going to help someone out. Mm -hmm. um, one thing that companies could do, and I push my clients to do that, is to put in incentive programs uh, where there's a certain amount of money put aside each year for an employee where if they want to work uh, towards maybe getting their PMP or maybe any other accreditation that could help them out personally and professionally help both of them out, the business and the employee. I think that's something that some of my clients are starting to do. And those are good incentives to have in place for your employees to be able to, to move forward with a company. Okay. And, and what, in terms of attracting employees, are there any other measures that you can perhaps mention that, the companies are using to attract uh, skilled employees? I, I, I think you, I think for us, sometimes you have to sell the story on what your company does and what your, what your culture is within that company, why you should work for that company. Like I know there's the old words like mission statements and stuff like that, but making sure you're a really good employer and that could be little things too. I think a lot of employees, 
like things like maybe recognition on their birthday. I know I, the one I work a lot with tradition, fine foods in Scarborough. They're really good with that. Just little things. Um, I think the word I've been looking for is I was at a conference with shoppers once with my wife and called it the carrot principle about putting incentives in place for your employees, which could include those that educational benefits, but also other little benefits or rewards that are there for the employees that keep them engaged and incentivize them. And if companies are talking about this in the beginning in the process, it's a good story to bring if you're trying to get someone into your company. And I, cause I do find now people are starting to be less salary driven lately and a lot more about what's my home life balance with this company. Mm. What kind of culture does this company bring? Uh, I don't think people want to go in and work in a toxic environment anymore because they overpay you. So mm -hmm. I think the companies have to have a story. You have to have something that's going to drive the person to want to go forward with you, like your company. I, I think that's very important. Right. Okay. Is there anything else about uh, hiring and retaining labor that you wanted to mention? The hiring part is uh, that's actually probably easier than the retaining part. Um, where we have run into problems is that specifically with people that are probably new to Canada that came here, very skilled, educated, and came here on a permanent residency. I find I've had some trouble keeping people at the companies because I get a really skilled person and I put them into a role with a small or medium company. And then another recruiter like me notices this person a year later, and then they come in, they come right. and find this person. Um, I think it's going to be very important for companies when you do bring in someone that brings in a really good resume, either from another industry here or from another country and in here that we figure out ways that we can retain them um, by incentivizing to stay. Because I know recently we had a situation with an engineer where he got an offer to leave the food industry and it was so beyond what we had, mm -hmm. uh, we had to let it move on and, that's going to be a struggle for food companies going forward as well, too. And, and figuring and engaging and keeping your talent. And yeah, people tend to move around a lot more now, Carolyn, than they right. used to. Um, I find a lot of people are two or three years at a company now. And all employers know that that's changing now. And that that's something we got to be cognizant of if mm -hmm. we're recruiting or for a food manufacturing company. For sure. Okay. Uh, that's all I had to ask right now, Alan. So I really appreciate you being here today and talking with us. Thanks again. Yeah, sorry for the dog bark. I don't know if we can edit that. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> yeah, that's, but, um, yeah, no, it's, I still think it's very exciting times in the food industry. That, like, as we know, Carolyn, like for these, you know, three years since March of 2020, things changed, but food consumption and how people consume food has kind of changed as well too, right? I think a lot more people are learning to cook again too. Mm. And um, and companies, like, I think it is an untouchable industry in that regard. People are going to eat, but I just think companies are going to need to be innovative with their products, but they're also going to have to be innovative in how they hire people, right? And what you do to get people to join your company. Mm -hmm. So that's important as well too. Yeah. Okay. Hopefully Thanks that again. answers all the questions. Yes, it did. <laughs>